And I think we're all set to begin. Um, we've got everyone online. Apologies for the slight delay. And uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, Gabor, uh, I think you're currently muted, but thanks so much um, for, for being here. Uh, I'm glad it did work out uh, with the technology. And a warm welcome to all of the rest of you. I see quite a few familiar names, also some new ones, and, and really a great uh, diversity of people uh, connecting today. I see uh, many of you introducing yourselves in the chat, logging in from Zimbabwe, from South Korea, from Brazil, our Congo, uh, really all over the world. It's very exciting to have uh, all of you here with us for this um, uh, presentation and discussion. Um, so I would like to welcome all of you. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Anne Herod Lang. I'm the Executive Director of PHAP, which is short for the International Association of Professionals in Humanitarian Assistance and Protection. And uh, we've been uh, organizing this series of online learning sessions on uh, different topics in the realm of humanitarian law and policy for some time now. This is the 20th. Uh, 20th event in the series, and uh, if you're interested, you can access uh, the archive of all of the previous events as well. We've been keeping recordings and related resources uh, for all of the previous events. Uh, so today we're going to be looking at uh, the issue of detention, uh, specifically in non-international armed conflicts, um, as there are some questions uh, about uh, the legal regulation of detention in such situations. So we'll be uh, having a, a guest presentation uh, from one of our frequent contributors uh, in our law and policy courses, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. Uh, we have actually already received several questions uh, from those of you who are registered for the events uh, in advance, um, and we'll be accepting questions, of course, throughout, uh, throughout the event, so please do um, uh, send those in when they come to your mind. I'm very pleased to be joined today uh, once again by a co-host, um, very happy to have on the line Noel Kennive, who's an associate professor with the University of the West of England, and uh, Noel and I uh, have uh, have co-hosted uh, events recently in this series, and it's worked quite well. So very happy uh, to have you uh, with us here again, Noel. Thanks so much. Um, perhaps, uh, Noel, I'll give uh, the floor to you to, to introduce uh, yourself uh, with a few words, and, and perhaps if you have any um, uh, sort of beginning thoughts about uh, the relevance of today's event for humanitarian practitioners. Well, thank you so much for inviting me again. It's it's nice to be back here with you. Um, for everyone, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, I'm Noel Kenive, and I'm an associate professor in international law, and I very, very much look towards um, today's presentation on detention in non-international armed conflict. All the more because I'm sitting here in the UK, where the Sarah Mohammed case is currently being litigated before the Supreme Court. So very briefly, and Gabor is going to tell you plenty about the case, but the case deals with the alleged unlawful detention of Saddam Mohammed by the UK armed forces in Afghanistan during a non-international armed conflict. And the interest for this case has gone way beyond the UK, as it's almost considered a test case about detention in non-international armed conflict. And it's very likely that not only the UK, but states more generally, will have to review their detention procedures and policies. More generally, the issue of detention in a non-international armed conflict raises a number of very, very interesting issues, problems, if you want to see them that way. And for example, whether international humanitarian law authorizes and regulates detention in non-international armed conflict, and also the relationship between international humanitarian law, human rights law, and domestic law. So very complex issues. And this is even further complicated when dealing with internationalized, non-international armed conflict, as in Iraq or Afghanistan, with the application of human rights law and domestic law by one state in the territory of another state has been questioned. So I very, very much look forward to this, uh, to this presentation. Uh, okay, great. So then um, moving uh, right into the, the substance of, of today's event, um, as Noel said, we're very pleased to have with us as our guest expert today, Gabor Rona uh, from the Cardozo Law School, uh, who will be uh, uh, looking at the existing uh, legal frameworks applicable to detention and armed conflict, and more specifically, the legal debate regarding detention in non-international armed conflicts. 
And um, uh, Noel, you've uh, uh, provided us a few uh, thoughts and uh, very um, interesting links to uh, to recent developments uh, as well, particularly in the UK. Um, perhaps I can go back to you now to take us through the specific learning objectives uh, for this session. We have quite a lot um, that we're aiming to pack in, uh, and so we're asking quite a lot of Gabor. It would be uh, very helpful, uh, Noel, for you to go through those uh, key points before um, uh, then passing the floor to Gabor. Yes, so let's have a look at, at the learning objectives. Gabor also, um, on one of the, the web pages of PHAMP, actually explained why it was so important for humanitarian workers to know more about detention in an international context. So it, it's quite Im important as a topic generally. So the learning objectives are to understand the concepts which are related to detention in armed conflict, including security detention, and also derogation from human rights in times of armed conflict. Then also to gain a better knowledge of legal provisions under international and on detention in both international and non-international armed conflicts, again stressing the difference between the two of them, uh, to get a be um, basic understanding of the applicability of human rights law and domestic law for the regulation of detention in non-international armed conflict, be aware of the peculiarities in the context of internationalized, non-international armed conflict. And last, but certainly not least, to be aware of the main proposed options to overcome the legal gaps, the legal problems surrounding detention in non-international armed conflicts. So can I now introduce Gabor? Um, so Gabor Rona is a visiting professor of law at Cardozo Law School, where he teaches international law of armed conflict and human rights law. He previously served as the International Legal Director of Human Rights First, as Legal Advisor in the Legal Division of the International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva, and has taught at the International Institute of Human Rights in Strasbourg and at the University Center for International Humanitarian Law in Geneva, Switzerland. So um, I'll leave now um, the floor to, to Gabor. Thank you. Since we've had a couple of technical problems, I just want to confirm that you can hear me. Yes, loud and clear. Terrific. So our question is, what is the source of the power to detain in an armed conflict that is not between two states, or what we call non-international armed conflict, or NIAC? The specific question is, where is the relevant law on grounds and procedures for such detention? I think that uh, questions about torture and drones, targeted killing aside, this is probably the most vexing, most controversial, and most significant of debates to come out of the so-called war on terror. And uh, as Noel mentioned, it has been fired up all anew in the Serdar Mohammed case, a decision of the High Court of England and Wales. Uh, a couple of background preliminaries. First, we need to distinguish between the concepts of international and non-international armed conflict. Sometimes people get confused thinking that, well, if uh, state A's forces fight uh, an armed conflict in another state, that must be international. But that's not so. The designation international hasn't so much to do with geography as it does with who is fighting whom. If a state is fighting a state, that's international. And that's true whether all of the fighting takes place within the territory of one state or on the territory of two or more states. NIAC, on the other hand, non-international armed conflict, is a war, an armed conflict, between either a state and an armed group or between an armed group and an armed group. And once again, it doesn't matter so much whether it takes place on the territory of just one state or several. Now, we do get into complications with this concept of internationalized NIAC. In other words, uh, a NIAC that crosses state boundaries, for example, the U.S. Uh, fighting al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, uh, U.S. Uh, fighting against ISIS in Syria. But note that internationalized NIAC is still NIAC. Uh, the grounds, of the, the, the line between the two types of armed conflict is drawn on the grounds of whether sovereignty interests are in conflict, not whether borders are crossed. So remember, um, in the realm of IHL, there are only, uh, well, Two flavors, chocolate and vanilla, IAC and NIAC. Uh, second point, uh, note that in our 
focus on distinctions between IAC and NIAC um, in, in relationship to detention. Right now, we're just concerned about grounds and procedures for detention. We're not concerned so much about conditions of detention or treatment of detainees. These issues are quite clearly governed uh, by IHL, and regardless of whether the armed conflict or is, is international or non-international. Third, very important point. In IHL, whether in IAC or NIAC, there are combatants and civilians. Again, only two flavors, chocolate and vanilla. A combatant is a person with a privilege of belligerency, immune from prosecution for fighting, but not immune for, from war crime liability. But not all fighters are combatants. So let's go to the first slide, or rather the second slide. Um, and since I'm not viewing what you're viewing, uh, let me just confirm that we're now looking at uh, International Armed Conflict, POWs, GC3? Yep, confirmed. Great. So here we show that in international armed conflict, um, the Geneva Conventions, the POW Convention, is quite clear uh, about what grounds there are for detaining combatants. And the ground is that if you're a combatant, you may be detained. It's as simple as that. Next slide, please. Then we go to the question of procedures. Remember, grounds and procedures is what we're concerned about. And we're still in international armed conflict. The Third Geneva Convention on Prisoners of War um, says that if there's any doubt about whether you are or are not a POW as, as defined by GC3, then your status has to be determined by a competent tribunal. So it's rather simple, but there it is. For international armed conflict or combatants, we have uh, details in the Third Geneva Convention on grounds and procedures for detention. Next slide. What about civilians? Likewise, in international armed conflict, there are provisions specifying grounds and procedures for detention of civilians. Civilians may be detained if the security interest of the detaining power makes it necessary. And then as far as procedures go, um, you see the second article, Article 43 there, which I I didn't uh, cite completely, uh, but it says that the detention uh, must be reviewed twice annually. That's different than in the case of POWs who may uh, simply be held without any periodic review until the end of hostilities. Um, so for both POWs and civilians in international armed conflict, we have rather clear rules, guidelines for grounds and procedures of detention. Now the problem, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. The problem begins when we get to non-international armed conflict. And as um, you probably all know, uh, common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions is, um, is the single um, rule of the Geneva Conventions that covers non-international armed conflict. And you'll note that, um, First of all, there's no combatant civilian distinction under Common Article 3, and that's because there is no combatant status for non-state fighters in IHL. And unlike the Geneva Conventions 3 and 4, Common Article 3 says nothing, nothing about grounds and procedures for detention. It presumes detention. Several of its provisions uh, obviously relate to persons who have been deprived of their liberty, but unlike GCs 3 and 4, Common Article 3 says nothing about grounds and procedures for detention. It does, however, make oblique reference to what later becomes codified in international humanitarian law. And that is this concept that I've highlighted about trials being required to afford all the judicial guarantees recognized as indispensable by civilized people. Well, why is that relevant to mere detention? Detention doesn't necessarily involve trials. The answer is because when you're looking for the judicial guarantees recognized as indispensable by civilized people, where do you look? You look to human rights law. That's where it exists. Next slide, please. Now, in addition to the Geneva Conventions, of course, the additional protocols to the conventions um, also cover international and non-international armed conflict. 
additional protocol one covers international armed conflict, but now we're looking at the preamble from additional protocol two, which relates to non-international armed conflict. And you see something very interesting in that preamble. Um, you'll note that while AP2, uh, if you look at its entireties, also says nothing specific about grounds and procedures, it does, however, make reference to the continued application of human rights law protections. Language is right there in the preamble. Um, international instruments relating to human rights that offer basic protection to the human person. And note by contrast, uh, I'm not showing it here, but if you take a look at additional protocol one preamble, that is the additional protocol on international armed conflict, that makes no reference to human rights law. That's not an error. It's not an omission. It's because the IHL of international armed conflict is detailed leaving little room for application of human rights law, at least on questions of grounds and procedures for detention. Um, the IHL of NIAC is sparse because states presume that their domestic law would be sufficient, and in keeping with considerations of sovereignty, they didn't want or need the type of international regulation that they did want and need for wars between sovereigns. Next slide, please. So if we are to have to and want to look to human rights law to fill the gap that's left by the IHL of NIAC concerning grounds and procedures for detention, as I mentioned, we must look to human rights law. The preeminent provision of human rights law relating to the prevention and prohibition of arbitrary detention is, the, is Article 9 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And it essentially establishes what we in the common law system have come to know as the right of habeas corpus. If you are deprived of your liberty, you are entitled to take your claim uh, that your liberty has unjustly been denied to a court of law. Next slide, please. Now, there has been a fair amount of litigation over the relationship between international human rights law and international humanitarian law in situations of armed conflict. And one of the preeminent cases is the International Court of Justice nuclear weapons case. It notes that uh, parties to the ICCPR may derogate from some of their treaty obligations in times of national emergency, for example, war. And Article 9, the article that uh, we just looked at a moment ago, is one of those articles subject to derogation. Uh, by contrast, the uh, right not to be arbitrarily deprived of life is not subject to derogation. But here, the court establishes the notion of a continued application of human rights law in armed conflict situations, and that the application of human rights law is to be determined with reference to the legal doctrine that we call lex specialis, meaning that where there is both a general source of law and a specialized source of law applicable to particular circumstances, then it's the specialized law that governs. And obviously, in armed conflict, IHL is the specialized source of law, while human rights law is the general one that applies um, whether in or outside of armed conflict. The converse is also true, though. If the specialized law, here IHL, does not provide the rule for the circumstance that you're inquiring about, and right now we're inquiring about grounds and procedures for NIAC detention, then the specialized law, IHL, cannot and does not govern. Rather, we then look to the general law, and that is human rights law applicable to all times. And that is the significance of, of the concept of lex specialis applicable to the question of NIAC detention. Uh, next slide, please. The ICJ also had occasion uh, in another case to further explicate this, uh, the, the way that the concept of lex specialis doctrine applies. Uh, next slide, please. Now, um, what I wanted to do here in this chart 
um, is to take a step back and put into context our conversation so far about NIAC detention. And what I wanted to show was that in the grand scheme of things, when it comes to uh, questions of uh, armed conflict, there are several issues at play. Targeting, who can you kill? Power to detain, right to challenge detention, questions about detainee treatment, and questions about detainee trials. And I've highlighted those in the, um, in the left vertical column. Then across the top, you'll see that I've um, detailed situations of peacetime, IAC, and NIAC to show how these different events are treated under law in these different circumstances. And you'll note that in international armed conflict, the IHO of IAC takes a very substantial role as to all of these matters. And of course, in peacetime, IHL has no role because IHL is purely the law of and in armed conflict. But in non-international armed conflict, the last column, you'll see that while human rights law has a minimum, minimal role on questions of targeting, and that's because IHL says quite a bit about targeting uh, the right to use force against individuals and military objectives uh, in both IAC and NIAC. And that's true whether uh, that relates to whether the rules are treaty rules uh, under the Geneva Conventions, additional protocols, uh, or other IHL instruments, or customary IHL. And likewise, questions about the treatment uh, of people deprived of their liberty is also well explicated in, in IHL, and that's true whether it's NIAC or IAC. But as you see, the power to detain and the right to challenge detention, as we saw from um, what doesn't appear in Common Article 3, what doesn't appear in AP2, those issues are not addressed directly by IHL. And that's why we have to apply the Lex Specialis Doctrine to get us to the international human rights law rules about uh, grounds and procedures for detention. Next slide, please. So let's talk about a couple of the complications. Lex Specialis is not um, a kind of one-shot consideration. There are a number of different ways of looking at Lex Specialis. Uh, rather, I should say, two basic ways of looking at Lex Specialis. One I call framework preclusion, the other I call rule preclusion. Let's put it this way. Some believe that anywhere IHL is applicable, namely in an armed conflict, human rights law is not applicable. And that for a long time was the prevailing United States view. And that's a framework exclusion uh, rule. In other words, because IHL applies, and of course it does apply to armed conflict, human rights law does not apply. That was, as I said, the U.S. view for a long time. However, as you saw from the slides that I just showed you about the ICJ's jurisprudence in the nuclear weapons case and the, and the wall case, the ICJ takes a very different view. And the ICJ's view is the one that prevails internationally. And that is that we don't exclude the entire framework of human rights law in armed conflict. We only exclude those, role, those rules of human rights law that address subjects that are already addressed by IHL. And while, uh, so let's go to the next slide. I'm concentrating on the U.S. because, of course, the United States is an important player, uh, not just in practice, but in, um, in, in setting standards, for better or worse, for much of the rest of the world on these issues. And here you see an excerpt from a U.S. report to the Human Rights Committee, uh, which is the treaty body for the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. 
And you'll see that the U.S., take a look at uh, paragraph 506, the U.S. distinguishes human rights law that is not relevant to the conduct of the armed conflict. And it distinguishes those from circumstances involving the conduct of the armed conflict. And they say that where, where the situation involves the conduct of the armed conflict, that's exclusively the province of IHL. In other words, while the U.S. isn't taking an absolutist framework preclusion view, theirs is, in fact, more of a framework exclusion than a rule exclusion view. What they're saying is, well, yes, human rights law applies even when we're in armed conflict. In other words, um, we're still obligated to you know, let you worship at the, uh, at the church or uh, at the church of your choice. But when the question is related to the armed conflict, namely detention, then the U.S. view is that IHL is the only framework that applies. Then there's another problematic that arises. And you see I highlighted at the very bottom of this slide um, this phrase, co the context of non-international armed conflict occurring within a state's own territory. Why only occurring within a state's own territory? Because the United States, again, unlike much of the rest of the world, takes the view that it has no human rights law obligations outside its own territory. Let's move to the next slide. Now, as to this question of extraterritoriality, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights says that it applies within its territory and in connection with persons subject to the state's party's jurisdiction. That's the language that's highlighted under Article 2. The European Convention, on the other hand, doesn't have the limitation within its territory. It only says within their jurisdiction, namely the jurisdiction of the state's parties. And the question that has arisen about the ICCPR is about that one simple three-letter word, and. In other words, within its territory and subject to its jurisdiction, the question has arisen whether that and is conjunctive or subjective. In other words, for the ICCPR to apply, does the person whose rights are allegedly at stake, um, is that person both within this, the jurisdiction of the state party and within its territory? Or is it enough that the person is either within its territory or subject to its jurisdiction? And the US, as many of us know, takes the position that the person has to be both within the subject of, uh, the, has to be both the subject uh, of the US's jurisdiction as well as within US territory. In other words, the US claims that it has no human rights law obligations under the ICCPR outside of its own territory. And of course, that's a huge issue for NIACs in which the US is involved, because of course, the US does, is not involved in NIACs on its own territory. Um, it is fighting wars on the territory of other states. Now, the majority of international jurisprudence um, disagrees with the US view and in fact agrees with the view of the Human Rights Committee, which takes the position that the ICCPR applies either if the individual is within the territory of the state party or even if the individual is outside the territory of the state party but falls within the jurisdiction of the state party. And that requires answering the question of, well, then when does the individual outside of a state's territory fall nonetheless within its jurisdiction. And that's when we get into the uh, jurisprudence of the European court, which has explicated at some length now the proposition that when a state exercises effective control on the territory of another state, that that triggers that state's jurisdiction. 
So um, let's now go to the last slide, uh, which is the, dis uh, the discussion of the, the Mohammed case. So as Noel mentioned, in Serta Mohammed, um, it was a case of, of an Afghan national captured by UK armed forces in Afghanistan, I believe it was 2010, and he was detained for about three months before uh, being transferred to Afghan custody, where he was then convicted in the Afghan courts uh, of offenses relating to the insurgency in Afghanistan. He then brought claims for damages in the UK court under the UK's Human Rights Act, which implements uh, the UK's obligations under the European Convention. As I mentioned, the European Convention, unlike the ICCPR, contains an exhaustive list of reasons that people may be detained. And, oddly enough, being an enemy combatant is not one of those detailed reasons. Now, it's important that this is a non-international armed conflict. Because it's a non-international armed conflict, there is no resort to the detention provisions of the Geneva Conventions because, as we mentioned before, those conventions only establish grounds and procedures for IAC, not for NIAC. Um, so in, if it were an international armed conflict, a detainee probably could not challenge detention based on the European Convention because in that case, there's a stronger argument that the Geneva Conventions are the applicable Lex Specialis, and they do provide grounds and procedures for detention. As to extraterritoriality, which of course arises when the UK is detaining somebody in Afghanistan, um, the court determines that yes, the UK does have European Convention obligations when it exercises control, and that can be over persons or over territory abroad. So the conclusion we reached so far is that, uh, in this case, that the UK has in fact violated Sardar Mohammed's rights under the U European Convention, even though these events occurred in Afghanistan, A, because the UK is exercising effective control in Afghanistan, therefore the European Convention applies, and B, because the European Convention provides no grounds in and of itself for detaining the individual, and because IHL does not operate as lex specialis authority in the situation of a non-international armed conflict, because the relevant provisions of IHL simply do not address the question of grounds and procedures for detention. And that leaves us, and I'll end with, the complicated question of then where do you find the law that governs internationalized, non-international armed conflict? If the armed conflict is taking place purely on the territory of one state and, say, the detaining authority, then, of course, the domestic laws of that state clearly apply. But if state A is conducting uh, an armed conflict on the territory of state B and that armed conflict is not, then the question arises, well, do you apply the law of the territory where the fighting is going on? Let's say, call that Afghanistan. Or do you apply the law of the country that's doing the detaining? Let's call that the United States. And that is the big remaining unsettled question. The United States, though, has established uh, statutory law for the detention of individuals following the events of 9-11. And so at least the United States has domestic law that uh, governs grounds and procedures for detention uh, of persons that it uh, deprives of liberty in non-international armed conflict, even if that non-international armed conflict is occurring, occurring outside the territory of the United States. But the question of whose law should or must govern uh, is still one that's left up in the air and still need to be determined. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Gabor. Um, as always, a really uh, remarkably clear presentation of what is uh, really some complex subject matter. Um, very much appreciate that. Um, I would, uh, for the q and I'll turn the floor over first to Noelle. We've been uh, chatting a little bit here in the background, and um, Noelle, I think, has a, a 
follow-up uh, question for you to, to lead us into the Q&A, although I think you, you did start to get into it a bit. Uh, Noelle, did you want to follow up um, with that question uh, to get us started? Yes. Um, Gabo, you actually mentioned towards the end that um, when the non-international armed conflict is happening on the territory of the state, then obviously there are no problems because we have a domestic law that is there to regulate the detention. How come actually the drafters of the additional protocol too did not think that there could be a state involved in an IAC abroad? How, how is that possible? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure you know, well, that they didn't think it was possible, uh, though I, and um, I don't have a kind of off the top of my head recollection uh, of the travaux or the negotiations, but I do recall that um, states were reluctant in a number of respects to create um, rules for non-international armed conflict where they felt that their domestic laws were, were sufficient for the matter. Now, as you suggest, uh, by 1977, when the second additional protocol came into being, the parties should have been quite aware of the phenomenon of internationalized, non-international armed conflict. But my guess, and this is, is purely speculation, is that given the history of how narrow uh, treaty regulation of NIAC had been up to that point, only common Article 3, I think states were still reluctant to enter into international regulation of what they considered to be uh, questions of purely national prerogative. And perhaps in hindsight, they should have seen that with internationalized, non-international armed conflict, um, they could not simply avoid the issue. Uh, but I suspect that at the time, states were simply not sufficiently cognizant of, of the need to regulate this and or um, if they were cognizant of it, um, they still could not reach any consensus on um, how that regulation should appear in international law. Uh, but as I say, since I'm, uh, I'm aware of some aspects of the negotiations and, and travaux here, uh, but not so sufficiently that I would consider you know, what I've just said to be gospel truth, it's probably more in the line of speculation. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Gabor. This is uh, Inherit. I'll just jump in here with uh, another question we have received from a participant. Uh, this is coming in from Jana. And uh, you were speaking um, at the beginning of your presentation, of course, about classification of different kinds of armed conflicts and uh, the importance of that um, as a first step uh, before getting into um, uh, further discussion of, of rules and so on. Um, at the risk of opening up quite a big subject here, uh, I wanted to pose Jenna's question about Syria. Um, she is looking for some clarification. She knows that um, some people say that in Syria we have uh, both a non-international armed conflict and an international armed conflict when looking at the bigger picture. And so she's wondering, uh, when thinking about detention in Syria, would that be considered to fall within an IAC framework or a NIAC framework? Uh, would it depend on who is detained by whom? Uh, over to you, Gabor. Okay, well, you're, you're absolutely right, right that it, that's an extremely complicated situation in light of the, um, the many states and non-state armed groups that are engaged in hostility there. Um, I, I, this subject has been um, uh, talked out on a number of, of blogs that um, our participants might be interested in looking at. Um, 
EGIL Talk, Just Security, Opinio Juris, um, they've all had fairly extensive conversation um, by various experts on, on the question of qualifying the armed conflict in Syria. Um, one of those experts, Professor Adil Haq, cites the ICRC commentary um, on the proposition that if State A is conducting military operations on the territory of State B without the consent of State B, even if it's not fighting against State B, that's an international armed conflict. And, and that is the situation in Syria. The United States is fighting on Syrian territory. They're not fighting Assad, Syria, or at least presumably, uh, but they are also uh, fighting without the consent of the Syrian regime. And so uh, Professor Haq uh, claims that that makes it inter an international armed conflict. But I think what, what he fails to emphasize is that that's true, if at all, only with respect to relations between State A and State B, not with respect to hostilities between State A, the U.S., and the non-state armed groups that it is fighting. Those remain NIAC. Um, so yes, I, I guess the answer is yes, it would depend on who is being detained by whom. If Syria were to be detaining U.S. troops, then you know, the full panoply of Geneva Convention's provisions would apply, those for international armed conflict, the third Geneva Convention, in other words, for prisoners of war. Um, but if the U.S. is detaining ISIS fighters, then it's still NIAC, and it's still the IHL of NIAC. And um, as I mentioned in my presentation, in that case, human rights law would determine um, the parameters of grounds and procedures for detention. The, the short story is that um, not all fighting in a particular locality is necessarily only um, IAC or only NIAC. So this is the case where it's not just chocolate or vanilla. Um, and you can, and in fact in Syria, you do potentially have um, international armed conflict and non-international armed conflict taking place side by side. Okay, thanks so much, Gabor, for taking that on. And um, uh, for our participants, I'll mention that uh, the resources that Gabor mentioned, um, we will uh, make sure to put those up as well uh, on the event page so that you'll have those um, uh, to reference after, uh, after the session is over as well. Um, Noel, I'll pass the floor over to you for the next question. Yeah, we've got two questions actually quite similar, one from Bridget and one from Pierrot. And both of them are actually saying that um, there are many more people who are actually saying that we should get rid of a distinction between IAC and NIAC, because in fact customary IHL applies to both, and that would actually maybe sort out the, the, the problems. What do you think about trying to remove this distinction uh, between NIAC and IAC, and if we would do this, do you think it would provide better clarity protection for individuals in NIAC? Do you think maybe, like Pierrot is suggesting, we could apply the civilian detention in IAC to NIACs more generally? Would that be possible? I guess anything is possible, um, and of course the advisability of um, what has come to be called the, this harmonization concept um, can only be determined after we see the product. Um, so it's entirely possible that states will want to get together and you know, renegotiate the kind of entire um, framework of IHL to get rid of the um, IAC NIAC distinction, just create one set of rules for all armed conflict. Um, I see several problems with that. Um, and the easiest one to address is the one that comes from my gut rather than my brain. Um, and that is that I'm afraid that if states get together to renegotiate, then the product is going to actually provide less in the way of humanitarian prote uh, protections and more authority to states 
uh, to use force and to conduct detention operations um, than than exist right now. So in other words, I, I just fear that the that um, the results would be um, less protective of the uh, the victims of armed conflict and uh, more uh, uh, weighted toward state power to conduct oper military operations uh, and to deprive people of liberty than, than the present state of the law. But then there are a couple of things that are grounded in the law itself that would concern me. Um, one is that um, we now have very different rules of understanding when IHL is triggered for international as opposed to non-international armed conflicts. For international armed conflict, the test is relatively easy. Uh, under Common Article uh, 2 of the, the Geneva Conventions, it's any time that State A uses armed force in its relations with State B. So the, the threshold is, is rather, rather low. For non-international armed conflict, on the other hand, uh, the test is not quite as clear, but, it, but we know it's higher. And according to the Yugoslavia Tribunal's Tadic decision, um, the general understanding is that NIAC is triggered when there are uh, hostilities between organized armed groups um, of sufficient severity or frequency um, that causes them to rise above the level that um, can be dealt with or is ordinarily dealt with uh, by domestic law and, and policing standards. And that's a much more amorphous standard than for triggering uh, the IHL of IAC. Then if you are going to um, harmonize the two areas of law, of course, you need to address this question of you know, when do we actually move from non-armed conflict to armed conflict uh, for the purposes of, of triggering IHL. And that's dangerous territory because in armed conflict, you can detain people that you otherwise cannot detain. And more importantly, you can kill people that you otherwise cannot kill. Um, so if we do the, a wholesale review um, for purposes of harmonization, we would have to contend with this question of triggers uh, for application of IHL um, that may very well end up um, enabling states to claim the benefits for themselves of the law of armed conflict in terms of power to kill, power to detain, um, but then withhold many of the protections uh, of IHL as well and also obviously withhold the protections of human rights law. The second area in which I think it would be problematic is that there is an important distinction between IHL, IHL of NIAC in, in terms of the recognition of privilege of belligerency. In IAC, state armed forces may not be prosecuted for merely participating in hostilities. Of course, that's their job. That's what they're required to do. Um, this privilege of belligerency applies only to the armed forces of, uh, of states, parties to armed conflict. Non-state armed groups do not have a privilege of belligerency. They're violating domestic law, murder, um, for example, when they engage in hostilities. And so the, the, this question arises as well. If the two areas law of law are going to be harmonized, what are we going to do about the distinction that in IAC, members of armed forces of states do have a privilege of belligerency, whereas um, non-internet, and, and well, whether in IAC or NIAC, uh, members of armed forces have a privilege of belligerency, but non-state armed groups do not. My fear, again, is that um, if there is going to be just one rule for everybody, um, then it will be it will be nonetheless that non-state armed groups won't be recognized to have a privilege of belligerency. Obviously, states would never agree to that, but they would nonetheless be subject to the strictures and and rigors 
um, of IHL um, in a way that, again, removes some of the protections that now exist um, under IHL for non-international armed conflict by virtue of the application of human rights law. So those would be my reservations to a harmonization project between the, the two angles of IHL. Well, thank you very much for this very comprehensive reply. So you, you, you're a bit fearful that it would open Pandora's box, so if I understand. And I think that's a position exactly. that is held by a lot of people, in fact. Um, can I ask you another question which has been asked by Darren? He's actually wondering whether in human rights law, when it applies in the context of uh, NIAC or armed conflict generally, does it have to be sort of amended, more nuanced to take into account the situation of the armed conflict or do we have to apply it in almost a, a pure or Puritan way? Well. Um let me back up to answer that by talking about the relationship between human rights law and domestic law. Um, states have human rights law obligations by virtue of the treaties that they enter into or because of the rules that they are bound by under customary law. But in order to uh, actually implement their, their international human rights law obligations, they have to promulgate domestic law. To actually make that happen. Now there's nothing in international human rights law that says you can't administratively detain people. There's nothing in human rights law that says you can only detain people if you think they are guilty of a crime and if you charge them with that crime and if you prosecute that, them for that crime. Now some of us might wish that, that were different. Some of us might wish that human rights law did create and contain a prohibition against what we call administrative detention, but it does not. So I don't think that human rights law has to become more detailed to give states the authority and the detailed instructions for how to conduct detention in NIAC. I think states nearly need, nearly need to develop their domestic law in a way that does not um, violate the provisions of, say, the ICCPR on the prohibition of arbitrary detention. And that does not require states uh, to detain only if they can prosecute. In other words, it allows states to uh, enable their laws to provide for detention in exactly the kind of circumstances that NIAC presents. You don't necessarily want to prosecute people, but you want to detain, say, fighters and, and perhaps even non-fighters who pose a security threat to prevent them from fighting against you, to prevent them uh, from, uh, from harming your military efforts. Um, but that can be done under existing human rights law so long as the state uh, creates legislation to authorize it. So I don't think anything needs to change with human rights law in that regard. But that does leave us with the problem that we discussed before about internationalized um, non-international armed conflict. And that's the question of, well, whose domestic law governs? And um, that is a case, I don't know if that's a case so much for human rights law to iron out. That may be a case for states um, on the basis of international agreement that still needs to be made, um, that has not been made. But I don't think that's, that's a question of um, adding more detail to human rights law. OK. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Oops, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Noel. Uh, one of the hazards of uh, having our co-hosts in different places, although I think in general it's been working quite well. 
Um, uh, but I'll jump in, uh, Gabor, uh, because we're we're actually very rapidly uh, nearing the end of our hour, and uh, I uh, wanted to ask you um, before we have to uh, before we have to close the session. Uh, well, first of all, thank you once again for for your presentation. It's uh, it was very uh, useful. I can see to everyone uh, who was here today, and and will be a great resource um, uh, moving forward uh, to to have um, uh, on the event page with the recording and and the different resources. Um, would you have, Gabor, any um, any final thoughts that you would share uh, share with uh, particularly humanitarian practitioners on this subject? It's a very complex um, complex area. Um, is there anything that you think uh, would be particularly important for humanitarian practitioners in the field to have uh, in their minds uh, regarding detention in NIAC situations? Well, so first, I, I also wanted to, to thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, present on this on this topic. Um, I really appreciate being able to you know reach so many interested people on on this issue. Um, as as far as as a final kind of thought to to weave it all together is concerned, um, I would commend to people who work in this area of law um, to resist the kind of knee-jerk reactions that we've seen from some states uh, that since we have the types of armed conflicts now that weren't anticipated at the time that these convention provisions were promulgated, that that necessarily means we need new international law. I, I would um, I would reject that notion. It's absolutely true that um, in 1949, when the conventions were were last revamped, and even in 1977, when the additional protocols came about, we did not have the kinds of armed conflicts that we have uh, the, today. However, um, there is nothing that I've seen that suggests that the combined application of IHL, of IAC and, and NIAC, along with um, the state's human rights law obligations, I, there's nothing that I've seen that makes that entire framework put together inadequate to deal with present day detention issues. Rather, what I see is that states are um, using an argument that these are old rules for new conflicts, they are using the, that argument as a way of getting around what should be well-established and respected rules that prohibit and prevent arbitrary detention, that prohibit and, and prevent um, abuse of detainees and, and torture, and that require detaining authorities to conduct trials that are in accordance with international standards. So my, I guess, final call would be when you hear these complaints of, you know, old law, new conflicts means that old law is no good, um, the response, I think, is, the proper response, I think, is that, well, what states need to do is to properly implement the combination of IHL and human rights law obligations into their domestic law, into their domestic practices, um, and that's how we reach the, the best possible balance between state security needs and humanitarian and human rights interests that international law represents. Excellent. Thank you. Important uh, closing thoughts and very well received. I will pass the floor now to Noel um, for uh, any final uh, reflections on your end as the co-host. Yes, thank you. Well, it's often said that there is no need to distinguish between international and non-international conflict, and, and we've seen this with the questions. But actually, the case of detention uh, shows that this distinction is still very much alive. And as Gabor has explained, the grounds and the procedures of detention in non-international conflicts are not regulated by international humanitarian law. So human rights law almost steps up as a filler, as a gap filler. But at the same time, it, it sort of creates a number of problems. The first is 
the relationship between human rights law and humanitarian law and the interpretation of a concept of lex specialis. Second, it raises the issue of the applicability of human rights law outside the territory of the state that is involved in the conflict. And third, it also requires answering the question whose domestic law applies to the situation. So I think really the title of the online session today is, is very much telling. There are actually indeed a lot of legal dilemmas relating to detention in non-international armed conflict and we, we, we're going to have to deal with them in the future. So I very much look forward to what will come out of the Saddam Mohammed case and also the ICRC discussions at the moment. It's a really relevant discussion today. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Noel, and thanks once again um, for, for helping out with the event today and looking forward to uh, to next time, definitely. Um, so uh, then we'll, we'll wrap things up. Um, many thanks again to all of you for your participation, for all the excellent questions. Uh, as anticipated, we weren't quite able to get to all of them, um, but we will uh, indeed do our best to get back uh, on those questions in writing um, so that you'll have those responses in the will also be available um, uh, as a resource to your colleagues as well. Um, the recording of today's session will be available uh, within the next couple of days. It will be available at the link you see on the screen there in front of you together with uh, all of the resources that were mentioned throughout today's event. Um, we will have the announcement for our next session coming up in the Humanitarian Law and Policy Online Learning Sessions series uh, coming quite soon. It will most likely be a session on protection of IDPs, although that's a little bit uh, TBC, uh, including the date. So we will keep you informed by email um, and hope to see you in that session, uh, which will hopefully take place in December. Um, Otherwise, uh, a big thanks to the PHAP team here as well, uh, to Marcus as always, and to Liz who uh, did all uh, the preparation on the back end, was not able to be with us uh, live today, uh, but has contributed tremendously to the events. And um, we'll all look forward to being in touch again soon. This is Inherit Lang from PHAP signing off from Geneva. Thank you very much.